Hello, hello everybody, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar on referendums in Europe, a democratic turn or dictatorial reversal. The latest in our webinar series on the Conference of the Future of Europe. With us today is Dr. Julie Smith, who is Reader in European Politics at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University, and also a fellow at Robinson College at Cambridge. She's also the editor of the Palgrave Handbook of European Referendums, a volume which provides an empirical analysis of referendums in the EU since the Second World War, as well as delving into more theoretical or legal questions surrounding this particular form of direct democracy. Uh, as many of you might already be familiar with our uh, general approach to these events, our conversation will be followed by a live Q&A. So please do send us your questions via the questions pane on your screens. We really look forward to hearing from you. And it's my pleasure now to, to welcome and to give the floor to our speaker. We'll begin with a, a brief introduction uh, to a recent book on referendums in the EU before we delve into some of the more kind of pressing questions uh, of, of uh, surrounding, surrounding referendums in the EU uh, with regards to uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe and more broader questions about legitimacy and democracy uh, in the EU. You have the floor. Thank you, Alex. Referendums, somewhat controversial, even starting with the very title of the book, which is the Palgrave Handbook of Re European Referendums because there is always that little bit of semantic discussion about whether we should talk about referendums and referenda, even before we get to the idea of, are they a good thing or not? The reason the book came about, the genesis, was not in fact, from my perspective, Brexit, but the Greek referendum of 2015, when the citizens of Greece were given a week to think about at the EU bailout and vote on whether or not they wanted to accept the bailout. By the time they actually voted, the offer was no longer on the table. It was the most bizarre experience anybody could have imagined. It was at one level a democratic moment. Citizens were being given an opportunity to vote on an EU related matter. And yet it didn't seem to be democratic. It wasn't well prepared citizens weren't given much information. And the very question itself was complex and abstruse, not least because actually by the time people voted, they were voting on something that no longer existed. And at that time, Cambridge was involved in a project called Podemia, which was on parliamentary democracy in Europe. Referendums obviously are not formally part of representative or parliamentary democracy in most cases. But I managed to persuade the powers that be in the Podemia network that we could maybe do a panel on referendums. And then we had an underspend. One of our co colleague organisations failed to produce the workshop they were going to do. And I put together a workshop in Brussels in September 2016 in the wake of the Brexit referendum. So although for me the interest in referendums academically came from the Greek case study, Holgrove were interested in the idea of a book post-Brexit. To the relief, I think, of everybody, the volume that came out in March of this year is not a handbook of Brexit. There are handbooks of Brexit, Two of the contributors to my volume, Jan Eric Fossum and Chris Lord, are actually producing Handbook on Brexit. This volume is rather wider. It doesn't seek to replicate the David Butler um, volume of the 1990s and be a handbook on referendums globally, but it looks at some thematic aspects of referendums in Europe beyond the European Union, but also considers questions of European integration. So we've tried to look at the 
theoretical and conceptual reasons why one might hold referendums, particularly if they're not mandatory. If there's a constitutional reason to have a referendum, as so often in Switzerland or in Ireland, then there isn't a choice on having a referendum. What is, I think, more interesting is why some countries, some political leaders, choose to have referendums. In most cases, they are an attempt to create a democratic moment to give citizens the right to speak. And yet in the UK, they've traditionally been pilloried for being devices of dem demagogues and dictators, avoided nationally until 1975. Why did I put dicta a dictatorial turn perhaps in the title? Partly to be provocative, but partly because at times political leaders do seem to call referendums because they want to challenge what's happening at a European level or to challenge their own national parliaments. In the case of Viktor Orban, let's hold a referendum on a European question to say, actually, oh, European Union, my citizens don't agree with you. In the case of the United Kingdom, that wasn't the reason for the Brexit referendum in 2016. But it was very noticeable that when Theresa May couldn't deliver Brexit through Parliament, when the direct and representative democracies came up against each other, she actually went on television to speak directly to the people. And that highlighted, I think, the real tensions between representative and direct democracy. And one of the reasons why a handbook looking at a variety of aspects of referendums theoretical, legal and empirical seem to be timely. And I hope your libraries will all think it's a very good idea to purchase a copy. Indeed, indeed. And um, in many ways, I, I suppose, since the, um, the Greek bailout uh, in particular um, and the referendum related to that, um, a lot of these questions of you know, reinvigorating um, democracy in the EU and um, kind of re-legitimizing uh, the European Union and uh, being creative uh, in many ways about how the EU can you know, bridge uh, the gap that in many ways and, and um, is, is often perceived to, to, to arise between uh, the EU and its, its citizenry. And so, I suppose in the context also of our project and in the context of um, kind of current developments related to the Conference of the Future of Europe, which is very much kind of focusing on these, these kinds of uh, debates, uh, perhaps it would be interesting also for, for our audience to kind of really unpick what in your, in your mind are kind of the main arguments for and against uh, referendums on EU related matters. Uh, at a national level, but also uh, in the case of kind of posited uh, pan-European referendums. Um, what in essence can make this intrinsically democratic practice uh, paradoxically ambiguous when it comes to its, its democratic credentials? Thank you. A lot of questions there. And I'm going, if I may briefly, to go back to the start of the integration process very briefly and then go back to the Convention on the Future of Europe 20 years ago. Because the slight irony is that when the integration process started, Jean Monnet wasn't particularly interested in the democratic legitimacy of the process. But others felt that it was important to have an elected parliament because that would be a way of bringing democracy into the European project. And over the years, that case was put forward and eventually in 1979, the first direct elections to the European Parliament came about. And the idea was that that was going to create input legitimacy. And yet, even 40 odd years later, there are still concerns that the European Union isn't seen to be sufficiently democratic. And that came to the fore at the time of the Nice summit of 2000, paving the way for enlargement. But although the Treaty of Nice was finalized, there was very much a sense that Europe had become disconnected from the citizens. 
And the slight irony is that Reconnect is a very recent, it's a current project trying to look at reconnecting Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. But we've been debating these issues very substantially for a good 20 years because the Nice Treaty paved the way for the Convention on the Fu Future of Europe. And at that time, the then Danish MEP Jens Peter Bonder criticised the Convention on the Future of Europe for being Brussels talking to Brussels, that the people who were there tended to be representatives of NGOs, the sort of people who'd be talking to each other anyway, not necessarily the ordinary citizens of the European Union. Now, I think the current conference on the future of Europe has a lot more opportunity really to engage citizens, precisely because the whole nature of social media, of Zoom, of other types of interaction, particularly since the COVID crisis, make that much more straightforward. But Jens Peter Bonder also, despite being a Eurosceptic, was rather keen on the idea of a pan-European referendum because he felt that would create a way of legitimising things. So I think in terms of would a pan-European referendum be a good idea, I think if we were looking at treaty reform coming out of the conference on the future of Europe, something that says this is how Europe plans to move forward, the advantage of a pan-European referendum, as opposed to a national referendum, is that it does create an equality among all the citizens of Europe. It's not that one country can block the integration process. And one of the big problems, I think, in the last almost 30 years since the Maastricht Treaty is that if one or two countries have referendums on a treaty, their citizens can either impede it or block it. So the Danes and the Irish have only managed to slow down the process of treaty reform. The French and the Dutch in 2005 managed to stop the constitutional treaty. But that then creates a real asymmetry among citizens. And so I think having referendums in some member states on treaty reform, when they're not happy in others, does create some questions about the democratic legitimacy of the European Union. And a pan-European referendum might be an opportunity to inspire the citizens and create a pan-European discourse that has long been lacking. A slight caveat with that is that somebody who started their academic career writing about elections to the European Parliament, I had long argued that if we only had an elected president of the European Commission, that would inspire people, they would be more engaged, and we haven't necessarily seen that. So there might be some caveats to having a pan-European referendum, but it would at least create the potential for common ground, and it would reduce that disparity between the citizens of member states. And you could potentially do it a bit like a Swiss referendum, that maybe you would allow reform to go forward on the basis of a majority of states and a major and majority of the population. Indeed, yes. And I, I, I was wondering, especially, especially when it comes to um, pan-European referendums, what kind of broader um, conditions should be in place for that to uh, actually be an effective, an effective tool, and I'm wondering you know, the age-old um, issue of a, of a lack of a, of a kind of European public sphere. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. as you were mentioning, of course, there is a uh, one could argue that um, referendums can indeed help engender that that public sphere. But on the other hand, you could argue, uh, on the other hand, that indeed uh, a public sphere is conditional for that. Uh, debate to, 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 to arise in, in the first place. And in addition to that, perhaps also the other aspect of the, of the broader conversation on, on referendums, which, of course, the main challenge that the EU is always struggling with is the great diversity uh, that it uh, is characterized by. And so um, all of its, or well, many of its policy outcomes are the, the result of compromise and um, and so on and so forth. So the intrinsic nature of referendums uh, is of course uh, 
countering that kind of that kind of logic uh, that is at the heart of, of the integration process. But perhaps you could you could um, yeah share share with us some 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 thought, thoughts on how that could become more uh, practical uh, as a as a solution in, in the future. Thank you. Um, I think the creation of a public sphere is probably the area which is subject or likely to be subject to a lot of academic discussion. Would it be quite such a source of discussion among citizens? I'm not sure. Are they going to say, well, we're not part of this process, if they're being asked to think about reforms to the European Union that might actually affect them? And I think part of the question is how far European integration is perceived to affect citizens. Robert Dahl, many years ago, when looking at European elections, but the same would be true of referendums, was looking really at how closely people are affected by a decision. So if it's at a European level, there might be only a small effect. So you're having a small um, say in what matters. But that of course then means if you feel you're not being very, significantly affected, you might not bother to turn out. So there needs to be something that is actually going to make citizens feel it matters to them. If there is a real reform that's going to make a difference. Um, as somebody who is no longer an EU citizen, it might be um, naughty of me to say, well, of course, if the EU were going to start having an, an EU-wide tax, that might actually stimulate some real interest and a genuine public sphere because everyone would be affected in a way that would be very significant. At that point, if you were going to have a pan-European referendum on having a pan-European tax, you would suddenly get one of the most pro-European countries, Luxembourg, becoming much more cautious about treaty reform, which would then of course highlight the real problem that if you we you were to have a pan-European referendum, even if you could create a European public sphere in which debate would happen, you would still have national interests, which might then ensure that the treaty was never ratified. So I am aware that trying to have an EU level referendum could create a block on treaty reform. On the other hand, since the, Constitu since the Lisbon Treaty of 2009, there hasn't been a great deal of enthusiasm about treaty reform either. And to some extent, it was very easy to assume that's because the UK was still part of the European Union and a block on integration. But we now have such a diverse European Union that I think the problem that we're likely to see is that some states, particularly a country like Hungary, is likely to say, even if there were to be treaty reform, well, you know what? let's try and ratify it by referendum. Not because we have to, but because politically we want to. And that would actually, I think, be more dangerous for the European Union than having a pan-European referendum, because at least if you had a pan-European referendum, you can have a case made by people who hopefully are passionate about what they're standing for. Whereas if it's left to some leaders in some member states, who perhaps want to go directly to the citizens to try and impede the very treaty reform that officially they've supported, I think is actually a greater problem. The final issue, of course, though, is the German Constitutional Court, because Germany can't have a binding referendum nationally. So whether it could ever be part of a binding referendum at the European level is something that I think will go through the courts for a very long time. Yeah, it's no 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 easy feat indeed to to reflect about how how these things could be could be carried out in practice. And on the other hand, um, we witnessed um, kind of around since two thousand and eight two thousand and nine, but also uh, in more recent years, kind of a a, a slight uptick in in. Um, national referendums that were kind of explicitly challenging decisions mm -hmm. that have been taken at a, at a European level. Um, and we saw that in the Netherlands, we saw it, as you mentioned, in, in, in Hungary. And 
I suppose it's unclear whether this is indeed a, a, a growing trend uh, that will continue um, in the future, but there are definitely kind of political and legal implications uh, that, that come into play when there are these kinds of uh, uh, um, votes that challenge decisions that have been already taken at an at a, at a intergovernmental or in any case at a supranational level. Uh, and perhaps you can, you can elaborate a little bit on that. And if there were hypothetically a, a kind of a, a proliferation of these kinds of, these kinds of practices at a national level, in which way could these be really made part of, of, of um, kind of the, the governance framework of the European Union in a, in a, in a, constructive, in a constructive way? Obviously, referendums are part of the fabric of European integration anyway, ever since the accession of Ireland and Denmark in 1973. Both of those countries had referendums on whether or not to join for constitutional reasons. And Ireland has had referendums on all subsequent treaty reforms. If, if something affects the Irish constitution, there has to be a referendum. And that hasn't actually been a bad thing for European integration, that even when Ireland has been asked to vote twice, as authors in the volume have suggested, so Bridget Laffan, actually at times it can be important to be able to explore ideas, look at the issues, and then maybe get some change, and voting again isn't necessarily seen as being undemocratic or ignoring the will of the Irish people. So the opportunity to explore issues and debate them in public can actually be important and give citizens who've had the opportunity to vote on treaty reform a sense that they have had the right to participate in the, de the debate and the thinking. And I suppose the two polar opposites are Ireland on the one hand with regular experience of the referendum process, rather like Switzerland, not quite so many as Switzerland, but a genuine practice of referendums. And the Netherlands in 2005, where the political elites and the people had no experience of a referendum, and there was a complacency on, at the level of the political parties, they just assumed that it would all be fine, that the Netherlands was a pro-European country. But what was coming through in 2005 was that Dutch voters were saying, when did the European Union change? Because they'd, they felt they'd never had a chance to vote on the integration process. They hadn't had a vote on it expanding. They hadn't seen it changing. And at one level, the answer is, well, that's because you elect your national government and most major decisions are then going to be taken in the European Council. If it's a strategic decision about the future of Europe, it will be taken through the member state governments. So indirectly, you've been voting for these things. But it's very rare that in a general election, the European question is going to be the main source of discussion. And so I think the opportunity of bringing in referendums on European questions is that you can actually then begin to have a more ongoing discourse, which the Danes have had. Whereas in 72, Norway, Ireland and Denmark had referendums and the UK didn't. Denmark partly had a referendum because the Social Democrats were split on the European question. They remained split, but the party didn't divide. Whereas in the UK, the Labour Party did split and re reformed, rebuilt, became more pro-European and the Conservatives became less pro-European. But the citizens kept saying, well, when are we going to have a say? And I think if you've got regular opportunities to talk about European questions, which arguably could be done in European Parliament elections, but that doesn't seem to happen, then maybe bringing people in for referendums on European questions would be a way to engage them rather more. Thank you. Thank you for that. And perhaps I can just bring in a, a, a question from one of our audience members which uh, refers to the uh, formulation 
of referendum questions, mm. which um, is mentioned to be kind of a key to their legitimacy um, and also to preventing populists from uh, manipulating um, referendums. So the question is, what are your lessons learned with regard to the preparation of such referendum questions by governing parties, as opposed to parliaments or citizen initiatives, um, citizen assemblies? Uh, who in you are, your eyes should be in charge of formulating the questions in referendums? <laughs> In the UK, the Electoral Commission played a very key part in framing the question in 2016. There had been a proposal, a private member's bill, looking at the possibility of a referendum in 2013 after David Cameron's floating of the idea of referendum at the Bloomberg speech. And at that point, the Electoral Commission gave some advice. So when the government came forward with referendum proposals in 2015, they tried to go with the Electoral Commission's advice. And the Electoral Commission came back with further refinements saying that the question should be, should the UK remain or leave? And the reason that it framed the question like that was because they said, having tested public opinion and public knowledge, it's not clear that everyone knows that the, Europe, that the United Kingdom is a member of the European Union, which was somewhat tricky. Um, so that was, that was why the Electoral Commission framed the question the way that it did. There are some questions about the role of the Electoral Commission, the powers that it's got, the sanctions it can implement. But I think having a body that is intended to be outside of the political frame is important. Um, I might not have liked the outcome of the Brexit referendum, but at least it was a clear question. There is, I think, a, a problem about referendums, which you talked about in your, one of your earlier questions, Alex, and I think comes in quite nicely here, that if you are having a referendum on a treaty reform, then that can be quite straightforward. Do you want this treaty reform? Yes or no. And you could logically do the same thing in every member state with that sort of question. The problem is when you get into the details of something that's multifaceted. So if there's a yes, no to a treaty, you might like some aspects of it, you don't like others, but the whole treaty collapses. But you could then renegotiate and have a narrower treaty perhaps. If you've got a referendum on should our member state stay a member state or not, then it's not only a binary choice, but it's one, so the, the question was still yes, no. And yet the possible outcomes aren't binary. And I think that's where direct democracy does have some difficulties because there have been a few attempts to have more than one question on a ballot paper. Sweden's tried it before now. But if you start saying, well, would you like to be fully integrated or semi-detached or leave, then you get into some lexical problems and you don't necessarily get a clear outcome. So I think if you're going to have a referendum, having an independent body framing the question is important. Having clear rules about the content of campaigning is important. But I was criticised at one point by Sir John Curtis, who basically thought I was being a little bit illiberal when I said that actually the Electoral Commission should, should be able to pick up and sanction campaigning bodies that actually mislead the public. Because of course, you can fact check something that has happened. You can't fact, fact check something that may be going to happen. And that's part of the problem, that you're not usually having a referendum on something that's already been implemented, but on the basis of what could happen. And because we can't predict the future, it is very much, his, his, her word, their word against somebody else's word. And that is, I think, one of the biggest problems with referendums. And are the lessons to be learned? Wearing my political hat, I'd say, don't have a referendum. So as an academic, I'm quite happy to talk about how it can be, there are ways in which referendum devices could be useful. 
in the future of European integration and engaging citizens. But you have to be very careful what you're trying to achieve. And if you don't know what you're likely to get, if you haven't thought through the outcomes, then you shouldn't engage in a referendum. And the one very clear lesson is that you need to have planned for both outcomes, that David Cameron wouldn't allow the civil service to plan for the leave scenario because he didn't want it to look as if the government conceded that maybe the citizens would vote to leave. But having failed to do that, there wasn't a plan in place for the UK to move ahead with. And we saw in the Brexit negotiations that the EU27 had a clarity of vision and a unanimity of voice that was completely lacking in the United Kingdom. Thank you for that for that great answer that I think kind of really uh, summarizes a lot of the key key questions um, when it comes to referendums in, in the EU. We have an additional question from the audience, um, which uh, focuses on national referendums. And so they would like to know how national referendums are used by governments as a political or strategic uh, leverage in negotiating uh, certain policy outcomes. Um, yes. Perhaps we can go with that, that, with that question. Yeah, and then there's another question, but we can we can move on to that later. Right, yes. So I can see Priya's question um, on the screen, uh, which is quite helpful because there are multiple bits to it. And the last of the three parts is, does it not fragment the entire European integration process? Unfortunately, the in integration process began to fragment with the Maastricht Treaty of 1993 and it fragmented because whereas previously the view had been that everyone should move forward in convoy at the speed of the slowest it, at the time of the Maastricht Treaty it was very clear that the majority of member states wanted economic and monetary union and the UK wasn't going to give in on the final stage of economic and monetary union so given there isn't a mechanism for kicking out a member state there wasn't in 1991 and there still isn't in 2021. There was a question of, well, do we move forward as far as we can? Do we move forward without economic and monetary union or do we find a compromise? And the compromise was that the UK and Denmark had opt-outs and they had those opt-outs without having a referendum. The Danes then had a referendum and voted no anyway. When there was some clarifications, they voted yes a second time. But the fragmentation comes in part, and the difficulty comes in part, because in order to reform the treaties, you need unanimity. And the only way to get around the requirement of unanimity would be to have a treaty reform that said that the next time we have a treaty reform, we don't need unanimity. But how you get to that point is almost impossible. So I think we are in a situation where fragmentation is almost inevitable and repeated enlargements have meant that the interests of the 27 member states and their preferences have come into tension far more than was the case for the six or the nine or the 12. How do politicians use referendums? It, they use them for different reasons. Sometimes they're used to try and keep a political party together. So if your party is fragmented on something, rather than saying, we're going to try to push it through parliament, where you might then not get the result you want in parliament and the party splits, you wave the whip, you say it's fine, people can campaign however they want to on this one issue, which is what the Danes have done frequently. And that's worked very well. So sometimes it's about saying we want our political parties to stay together on national issues and on the European question, we'll go to the people. And I think that is actually fine because that reflects the fact that political parties have come together primarily for national reasons and European questions don't sit very comfortably with those divisions within the member states. The problem comes when you've got a government for example, Tsipras government in Greece in 2015, or Viktor Orban with questions of migration. Do you, 
are they running a campaign because they want the, the proposals to be ratified, i.e. they're working with the grain of the other 26 member states, 27 member states at the time, or are they trying to undermine the process of integration? And I suspect that in the case of Viktor Orban, the latter is something of the case. Well, I, think, I think there's a difference. I think Tsipras was trying to get the best outcome he could for Greece in the context of a crisis. I think Viktor Orban is quite keen to use the Hungarian voters as a way of saying, well, my view of Europe is very different from the mainstream view of Europe, but I'm speaking for my people. And if you don't like it, well, that's tough. And I think that reflects a move towards illiberal democracy and challenges to the European norms that aren't caused by referendums, but there's a populist dimension that he is bringing in to try and get the Europe he wants which he can't necessarily achieve by consensus with the other 26 leaders of the member states. So I suppose the, uh, the challenge is not only or not simply related to referendums themselves, but it's, it's really a question of, of kind of the state of democracy uh, within individual member states, of course. Um, and course, the more, the more, the broader uh, questions of legitimacy across the EU. But perhaps um, I'm wondering, um, given all the points we've uh, touched upon in our, in our conversation, it seems that in reality, uh, kind of studying referendums really opens the door to what, what are some of the, the big challenges that uh, the EU faces, and, and some of them we've, we've, um, we've touched upon. I was wondering whether you could perhaps elaborate a little bit more um, on issues such as the quality of public discourse uh, and, of course, the impact of the media uh, within, within member states, uh, which are dimensions of the, of the specific challenges that surround, for example, referendum debates, but are also broader questions of, kind of democracy and, and, and um, legitimacy at a, at a European at a European level. Um, so perhaps we could we could broaden uh, the, the conversation in that in that direction. Yes, um, there are a lot of sections that I'm not sure I'm going to have picked up all of them. So if I've missed something, come um, please come back. Um, one of the things at the outset of integration was that there was clear output legitimacy, that people, citizens could see the benefits of integration, and that created a sense of legitimacy, which appeared by the 1970s to have drifted away. By the time we get to 2008, 2010, with the global financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis, I think we've begun to see very much an asymmetry in terms of European integration, that some states appear to be beneficiaries, some less so. And particularly with the Eurozone crisis, there appeared to be an asymmetry of power and the discourse became almost ant antithetical to the origins and expectations of the integration process, that they became conflictual rather than consensual. And that wasn't because of a referendum, that was because of the very different interests of particularly Greece and Germany. What seems to have begun to happen with the COVID crisis is initially there was a danger of fragmentation, but gradually there seems to have been more cooperation. And so I think the more areas where there are interests of, of common interests, the easier it is to get a Europe-wide discourse that is consensual and might be forward-looking. The problem still, I think, is that whereas within member states, the discourse tends to be, lead to debates between left and right or bet between those who are putting forward more populist versus more mainstream um, liberal approaches, doesn't quite map out into the European level and there is still more of a nationalist discourse and a sense of national interest permeating 
the European level than is conducive to furthering the process of European integration. And how one overcomes that, I think, is one of the challenges, because if Europe feels disconnected from the citizens, is it disconnected from all the citizens or is it speaking well to the citizens of France and Germany, but not to Greece and Italy? Are the differences within the member states? Are we seeing new divisions that are maybe between what Theresa May called the some words and no words? Are, you know, are, did the UK referendum, for example, reflect some differences of opinion that we also see in the 27, and I think to some extent it did. So that the danger is that the sort of discourses we're getting highlights the disconnect between Europe and its citizens, but it's also between sometimes national elites and the citizens as well, reflected then in the rise of the populist and far right in many member states. And so getting a European level discourse that is going to move us forward in a way that supports the values of liberal democracy, human rights and the rule of law is the real challenge, particularly if in one or two member states, the people who are challenging most effectively are in fact the presidents or prime ministers of the member states concerned. Very much so. And I guess an additional point I, I, I was making earlier was simply, um, the big uh, question, but I, I think it's relevant to, to our conversation of, um, well, to put it simply, fake news, right? Uh, which yep. I know is a big, it's a big, uh, is a big uh, topic, perhaps for another for another event. But um, that, that that is, I guess, another another tension that develops between the kind of the, the need and the the demand for. A greater public debate and, and indeed also kind of um, constructive uh, contestation of, of um, European integration and policy outcomes and so on and so forth. But then, of course, um, the quality of public discourse surrounding all these issues is what I suppose really can determine um, how, how productive these, these processes can, can truly be. Um, so perhaps you could you could share some some thoughts about that. So I think here the best example is Switzerland, where if you've got a referendum and there are many many referendums and initiatives in Switzerland, you have a brochure that's provided that has the yes side, the no side, and the government position. And I was told on Saturday that in fact if there's a mistake in that document you can even bring a case for the referendum to be rerun because you know false information misinformation is given i think we do need to find a way of disseminating genuine information more effectively and part of the problem is the rise of social media and the fact that people are increasingly in their own social media bubbles and that those bubbles are very often far less regulated than the mainstream media, be it the print media, radio or television would be. So, for example, if we're doing a reconnect panel, most of the people signing up to a reconnect panel, you might expect to be the sort of people who really want to think about European level democracy. But there might be another panel going on in a parallel Zoom meeting right now that says, that's led by Steve Bannon, that's looking at how we dismantle Europe. And so fake news is important, but also the fact that we don't necessarily talk to everybody anymore. Whereas in those early referendums in the 1970s, there tended to be two or three terrestrial channels. So people tended to be listening to the same debates for and against. And now we don't necessarily do that. So yes, we need to find a way of stopping interference from Russia, Korea, but we also need to find ways of speaking beyond our own bubbles of people who think like we do, reaching out to those who maybe don't want to hear the arguments that we want to make. And that's one of the issues that I think we need to think about. And maybe the Swiss model goes some way to doing that. And I think that's a, a wonderful uh, conclusion uh, to our webinar today. I think this is all the time that we have. I would really like to thank uh, 
and uh, Dr. Julie Smith for this wonderful exchange, as well as our audience for joining us today. Please keep following Reconnect at Reconnect EU and check out our website at reconnect-europe.eu, where you will find, of course, updates about our upcoming events. On the 8th and 14th of October, we have two separate workshops, one on the rule of law, the other one focusing on current challenges surrounding EU trade policy, and we hope you will join us then. From myself uh, and Julie, it's thank you and goodbye. Thank you.